Gloria Day. Good morning. It's great to welcome all of you here in worship. My name is Randy Miller, one of the pastors here, and it's just wonderful uh, to worship our Lord today. This is an educator blessing later on in the service, and we're also celebrating Holy Communion. So I encourage you in the QR code in the pew ahead of you, uh, scan that, check in for worship, read our communion statement. That's a great way to prepare your heart to receive communion. And uh, I also want to highlight uh, the fact that uh, on one of our band members here, uh, Sebastian, one of our youth, he's playing guitar. <laughs> want to highlight him. So Sebastian, thank you. I'm going to embarrass you. Thank you for sharing your talent with us today with the band. Would you join me in a word of prayer? Lord, we thank and praise you for creating this day, creating this moment for us to worship you. Uh, Lord, you are with us in each and every moment, not just on Sunday morning. And so we thank you for your presence that's here uh, to fill our hearts, to fill our souls. Uh, Lord, to get us ready for the new week here, full of your blessings, full of adventure. And so, Lord, we pray that you would continue to go before us uh, and that our worship of you today would glorify, praise, and honor you. This we pray in your name. 
Amen. Christians and Christ followers throughout many, many centuries have shared this common faith. And would you express this faith with me as we recite the Apostles' Creed together? I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he will come to judge the living and the dead. And I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Church, we live in a world right now that is consumed with fear. Turn on the news if you get on social media or Facebook or Twitter or Instagram. We're constantly being bombarded with fear mongering and, and sadness. But I think as Christians, we can stand in the fact that God loves us and that we can be the examples for the rest of the world. And we don't conform, but that we can show the world what God can do and we can believe in his promises and we can stand in his love. So let's sing this next song. Amen. Darkness tries to roll over my bones When sorrow comes to steal the joy I own When brokenness and pain is all I know I won't be shaken, no I won't be shaken My fear doesn't stand a chance when I stand in your love. My fear doesn't stand a chance when I stand in your love. My fear doesn't stand a chance when I stand in your love. Shame no longer has a place to hide. to the lies I'm not afraid to leave my past behind Oh, I won't be shaken No, I won't be shaken My fear doesn't stand a chance when I stand in your love My fear doesn't stand a chance when I stand in my fear doesn't stand a chance when I stand in your love. There's power that can break off every chain. There's power that can empty our grave. There's resurrection. There's power that can empty out the grave. There's resurrection power that can save. There's power in your name. There's power in your name. My fear doesn't stand a chance when I stand in your love. My fear doesn't stand a chance. When I stand in your love, my feet doesn't stand a chance when I stand in your love. My feet doesn't stand a chance when I stand in your love. My feet doesn't 
Grace, mercy, and peace be unto you in the name of Jesus, the risen Christ. Amen. I am Steve Garbrandt. I'm blessed to be head of school at Lutheran South Academy and blessed to be vicar here at Gloria Day. And um, this morning, we are wrapping up our sermon series about love. What is love from 1 Corinthians chapter 13? Throughout this series, you've heard from Pastor Randy and Pastor Dan how they have shared how love is patient, how love does not envy, and how love is not angry. And this morning, we will focus on verse 6 of 1 Corinthians 13, where it says, Love does not rejoice at wrongdoing, but rejoices with the truth. Or in the NIV, love does not delight in evil but rejoices with the truth. Tomorrow, Rachel and I celebrate our 24th wedding anniversary. All that applause needs to go towards her for putting up with me. Um, I still have those uh, black and white Doc Martin saddled shoes. I still have them. I was going to wear them this morning, but my feet have grown since August 8th, 1998. Um, but yes, I still have those. There's only two things I was allowed to pick in our wedding, and that was the shoes I was wearing and the beer at the reception. So that was, that was good enough for me. 24 years of wedded bliss. Um, it starts our 25th year of marriage and our 25th year of ministry. And boy, we were young back then. And when we said our I do's at that wedding ceremony, Rachel's Uncle Mike, a now sainted LCMS pastor, uh, he made us turn and face the congregation. And we had to yell at the top of our lungs, divorce is not an option. And our siblings, we, Rachel and I are the oldest in our families, and in our siblings in turn, they have had to do the same at their weddings. And when the time comes for my sons, Jonah, Eli, and Silas, I pray that they will, too, make that same declaration. In fact, Rachel and I have been earnestly praying for our sons' future wives ever since our sons were born. We definitely pray the love is patient part over and over as we know, our sons' as wives are going to need a lot of patience dealing with them. Or perhaps our sons' as wives are going to need a lot of patience in dealing with their in-laws. And in praying for our sons' as future wives, we've ha we have worked really hard to try and instill the importance of love. The importance of marriage. The importance of family. Even when our sons were really, really little, we spoke about these things. About the importance of being a close family and the importance of choosing the right godly spouse. One day, Eli, who is streaming from college in Michigan right now, when he was a young boy, he said, I'm going to live on a house on a lake. And Jonah, who is only a year older than Eli, said, I'm going to live on a house on a lake too. I'm, I'm going to live on that lake. You know what, Eli? We'll live on opposite sides lake. We can take a boat to see each other whenever we want. And Silas, who was probably around four at that time, he said, he looked at Jonah and he said, 
Jonah, can I live in your basement? <laughs> and Jonah said, sure, Sai, that would be great. We could play video games all the time together. Well, the conversation continued with rules about their future wives. And Rachel and I said, well, boys, uh, we only have two rules. Your wife has to love Jesus, and your wife has to love our family. The rest of the rules, they're up to you. So Jonah said, well, my, my wife has to love Jesus, and my wife has to love our family, and my wife can't eat trash. And Eli, uh, our, our, our sports son, he said, well, my, my wife has to love Jesus, my wife has to love our family, and she's got to love sports, too. Silas, he finished by saying, well, okay. My wife has to love Jesus. My wife has to love family, especially Jonah. And she has to love video games because we're going to live in Jonah's basement and play video games all the time. <laughs> love that delights in the truth. Perhaps instead of rules for choosing their wives, we should have been working on how they speak to their loved ones. What words they use. Because words matter. In Matthew 12, 33 through 37, Jesus says this about words. Either make the tree good and its fruit good, or make the tree bad and its fruit bad. For the tree is known by its fruit. You brood of vipers. How can you speak good when you are evil? For out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. The good person out of his good treasure brings forth good, and the evil person out of his evil treasure brings forth evil. I tell you, on the day of judgment, people will give account for every careless words they speak. For by your words, you will be justified, and by your words, you will be condemned. You see, what one says is a reflection of one's heart. Just as a tree is known by its fruit, what one says speaks to what is in one's heart. What is one's character? A person's character is known by the words that come out of his mouth. Spoken words lived words. Fun fact, did you know that the average person from the first good morning of the, of, of the morning to the last good night of the evening, the average person has about 30 conversations a day. The average person, 30 conversations a day. Statistically speaking, we will spend 13 years worth of our lives just talking if we were to write down the words that the average person speaks, we would come up with, in one year, if we wrote down the words that the average person speaks in one year, those words would fill 264 books of over 200 pages, all just from the words we speak. Astronaut Michael Collins was speaking some time ago at a banquet and he estimated that the average man speaks about 25,000 words a day. And the average woman, about 30,000 words a day. And he added, unfortunately, when I come home each day, I've spoken my 25,000 words. And my wife hasn't started her 30,000. <laughs> That's a lot of words. But here's the reality. It does not take a lot of words to show what is in one's heart. For what comes out of a person's mouth, the words that they speak, it shows what's in their heart. It shows the love of their heart. Jesus says this in Matthew 15, 18 through 19. Jesus says, but what comes out of the mouth proceeds from the heart, and this defiles a person. 
For out of the heart come evil thoughts, murder, adultery, sexual immorality, theft, false witness, and slander. My friends, we don't have to talk to a person very long or on a very different uh, occasions to find out whether in one's heart it is pure, wholesome thinking or if it's lustful, evil, dirty thinking. We don't have to listen to a person very long to find out whether one's heart is kind and gentle and thoughtful or if it's manipulative, cruel, or deceptive, or evil. Because what is in one's heart is eventually going to come out of one's mouth. The problem is our sinful nature in the fallen world in which we live loves this unwholesome love. It loves a love that is not really love. For the world, love is manipulated and manipulative. Pressures that accompany a deceitful love. Words like, if you love me, you'd sleep with me, are spoken in manipulation. Our sinful nature in the fallen world in which we live loves a masked love. It loves a masked evil. How many of you remember the TV show Friends? Some of you, it was a popular show. It was, very, it was a popular show, fun-loving, carefree, hanging out at the coffee house, living life as friends. And during the run of uh, the seasons of Friends, a dark and disturbing movie called Pulp Fiction came out in the movie theaters. Maybe some of you remember that. Violence. Drugs, sexual assault. Which one was worse than the other? The R rated Pulp Fiction or the fun loving TV sitcom? One was evil masked, and one was evil unmasked. In Friends, characters were. Sexually permissive, even though you never saw it on screen. Uh, however, their, in their uh, promiscuity, their, their promis, uh, promiscuous lives seemingly were filled with no apparent consequences. Evil was masked. Pulp Fiction, on the other hand, it was evil unmasked, dark and disturbing, full of consequences. There was no deceit just raw. Which one was worse than the other? Well, today, the envelope continues to be pushed. Today, evil masked and evil unmasked are so easily intertwined and drawing viewers and voyeurs in, captivating them and embracing that which is unwholesome. There is nothing new under the sun. You see, when Paul wrote these words about love of 1 Corinthians 13, the city of Corinth was a disaster of morality. Corinth was an evil place with pervasive idol worship and rampant sexual immorality. The recently converted Christians in Corinth sometimes had a hard time shaking those bad habits, those old habits. And to combat these evils, Paul taught that love does not enjoy or delight in such evil actions. Rather, true love finds joy in truth and righteousness. Consider a wholesome marriage. 
God created man and woman to be together, to be fruitful and to multiply. God gave man and woman a great gift, the, the gift of sexuality, the gift of intimacy. The gift of intimacy outside of the construct of marriage sadly leads to everything but the joy that God has intended for us. Intimacy outside of marriage leads to fear. Perhaps a, a fear of a unwanted or unplanned pregnancy. Perhaps the fear of someone finding out. Perhaps the fear of being cheated upon or rejected or used or manipulated or whatever. But intimacy in the construct of marriage. A wholesome marriage. There is no fear. There is no wondering. No manipulation. No rejection. It is man and woman becoming as what God intended. A wholesome marriage gives us a snapshot of a love that is true. God reveals for us this truth about love. Through the Apostle Paul, he writes in 1 Corinthians 13, love is patient, love is kind. Love does not envy or boast, it is not arrogant or rude, it does not insist on its own way, it is not irritable or resentful. It does not rejoice at wrongdoing, but rejoices with the truth. Love bears all things. Love believes all things. Love hopes all things. Love endures all things. My friends, love is not manipulative. Love does not trick. It does not lie. It does not deceive. Love does not harm. It does not tear down. It does not gossip. It does not delight in the misfortunes of others. Rather, true love rejoices with the truth. True love rejoices what is right and good. Anything that covers up sin or seeks to justify wrongdoing is the polar opposite of a godly love. Love does not sweep sin under the rug. Love does not try to find a way to uh, get away with bad behavior. And it does not put up with injustice. Instead, true love treasures truth. True love celebrates good behavior. True love promotes virtue. True love has nothing to hide. Yes, love rejoices with the truth. We have several educators among us this morning. And later in this service, we're going to have a special blessing as they get ready to start a new school year. And as we consider that love rejoices with the truth, I ask you to keep our educators in prayer. So much of education is rooted in legalism. Grades, attendance, discipline. But teachers have a beautiful responsibility. Whether public or private or parochial, our teachers have that opportunity to teach and share the truth of love. What an admirable calling to do so, to help our youth understand truth and love. And boy, teachers have it so hard. Why? Because they're dealing with sinful kids and sinful parents, too. One night, many, many, many years ago, uh, 18 years or, or so ago, 
Rachel and I were in the midst of potty training Jonah and Eli. Very few teachings in life are harder, I, I think. And we had a bag of lollipops that we were using as rewards for success. And this one night as we lie in bed getting ready to go to sleep, our, our door was customarily cracked open so we could hear the boys if they needed anything. Jonah and Eli, they shared a room down the hall. And as we're getting ready to go to bed, our cracked door slams shut. And then I hear the pitter-patter of feet running away. And then I hear another door slam shut. I thought, okay, what's going on? So I get out of bed and I walk down the hall to their bedroom, the, the room that they shared. And I did a little bit of fatherly eavesdropping outside their door and I, I hear this. It's okay. They'll never know. I shut their door. They can't hear us. So that's when I sprung the door open, flipped on the lights and there they are. Both of them in the same bed, hands under the covers, and eyes shut, and snoring. <laughs> so I, those stinkers. I walked over and I pulled back the bed sheets to see what was going on. And there was that giant bag of lollipops right there. That was on top of the refrigerator. So that... And after a heart-to-heart -heart about honesty and deception, I returned to our bedroom and I said to Rachel, if they are like that at three years of age, what's it going to be like when they're 16? <laughs> well, that's what teachers have to put up with. Teachers of kids of all ages, they have to deal with sinful kids. So teachers... Remember that love is patient and love is kind and love does not anger. And those of you who are not teachers, pray for the teachers. For these kids know not what they do. Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. Those were words Jesus spoke as recorded in Luke from the cross. This same Jesus who says, I am the way and the truth and the life is the same Jesus who went to the cross out of true love. For God so loved the world that he did not send his one and only son. He sent him to the cross because of his love for us. God did not put conditions on that love. He, he, it wasn't, I'll send my son to the cross if... No. Romans 5.8 says, but God shows his love for us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. What a great act and display of true love. Love that is selfless. Love that is patient and kind. A love that does not envy. A love that does not anger. A love that does not delight in evil but rejoices in the truth. A love that rejoices with the truth. A love that rejoices with Jesus. A love that bears all things, including the cross. A love that believes all things, including the resurrection. A love that hopes all things, including the life to come. A love that endures all things, including the sacrifice for our salvation. So as we wrap up this sermon series on what is love from 1 Corinthians 13, that passage ends with, so now faith, hope, and love abide, these three, but the greatest is love. Why is love the greatest? The answer is because love is eternal. Love is what moved God to send his son to save us. God's love is what we base our hope 
and gives us the reason to have faith. And in turn, love is the centerpiece of the Christian ethic and must remain as the believer's focus in every era and culture it is how we are to treat one another. We love because God first loved us. So my friends, live in his love and live out his love. Amen. It is at our part of our worship where we receive our offerings. And there are many ways in which you can support the mission and ministry here at Gloria Day. Uh, through online giving, you can uh, also through the offering plates where you check in uh, this morning and have our communion statement, you can also give electronically. Um, and so I invite our ushers to come forward.
Cause you are good, you're good As we celebrate the goodness of God, we see his goodness in this meal of Holy Communion. So I invite you uh, to accept the invitation of the usher as they guide you to your communion station. And if you have mobility issues and can't get around, uh, feel free to let an usher know. We would be honored to bring communion to you. Let us pray. Lord, we come before you this morning and we thank and praise you for your goodness and for the love that you've given us and a love that you've shown us in your son, Jesus Christ. Lord, we pray that that love would deepen within our hearts, that that would be extended to other people and to those around us. Lord, that we would continue to grow in that love and what it means for our lives, not only in relationship with you, but in relationship with one another. Lord, we thank you for rain. We thank you that you provided rain here in our area. Lord, where there is drought, we pray that you would provide relief. And Lord, help us to be thankful and grateful each and every day for your mercies and your goodness in our life. Lord, for those who face surgeries or complications from illness and disease, we pray that you would be a God of healing and work miracles in their lives. And Lord, uh, that you would surround them with uh, doctors and nurses and family and friends to love and support them through this journey. And Lord, for these prayers and all other prayers that are weigh on our hearts, we lift them up before you. And Lord, we pray that you would answer them according to your good and gracious will. Lord, we pray all this using the prayer that your son Jesus has taught us to pray together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. I'd like to invite the communion assistants forward. And as they're coming forward, uh, we want to encourage you to use this time as a, a time of confession. Uh, we've been journeying through this series of what love is and what love is not. And maybe that brings up for you some failures and brokenness in your life. And use this time to confess that to your Lord because he is a God of mercy and he is a God of love. And he promises every time we confess our sins that he is faithful and he's just. And he will forgive us of all of our sins when we go to him. And as you receive this meal, you can visibly see his forgiveness, that he has given you his very body, his very blood, to strengthen your faith, to forgive you of all of your sins, and to heal you of your brokenness. So we hear these words that our Lord spoke in the night when he was betrayed, when he took bread and gave thanks. He broke it and gave it to his disciples and said, take and eat, this is my body which is broken for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. And in the same way also after supper he took the cup. And when he gave thanks, he gave it to them and said, take and drink of it all of you. This cup is the new covenant in my blood shed for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sin. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. The gifts of our Lord's body and blood are prepared for you that you would trust in his love and walk in his goodness. Welcome to our Lord's table.
And now may the seating and drinking of our Lord's body and blood, may that nourish you and strengthen your faith until life everlasting. Go in his peace and rest in his forgiveness, that you are forgiven in his name. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. We have uh, some updates and events coming up in the life of our church that we want to let you know about. Uh, the Astros Night is uh, this week. There's still tickets available, so be sure to go online, purchase your tickets, and we will forward those to you. That'll be a great time. Uh, our choir, in fact, is singing the national anthem, so it'll be awesome to cheer them on and uh, root for a win uh, for the Astros there this week. Uh, next week, we have a kids and student blessing as we return back to school, uh, and that'll be at both services, uh, so be sure to uh, bring your kiddos and bring your students uh, so we can have a blessing over them as they begin another school year. Uh, we also start a new sermon series next week called This Little Light of Mine, and uh, we're going to look at how Jesus has given us this faith to be a light so that we can be full of hope and joy uh, for this world that is so dark. And so be sure to join us for that series uh, as you uh, are equipped to be a witness for him uh, and share your faith with others. Uh, this is the educator blessing, so I would like to invite at this time all the educators, no matter how you serve in a school setting, uh, to feel free to come on up and come join us here on the platform. And as they're coming up, I would encourage all of you to uh, visit four tables outside. Uh, these are our ministry partners, uh, so our very own Day One Christian Academy, our preschool and child care center, uh, Wickham Elementary, a school that we serve uh, here in the area, as well as Highlands Latin and Lutheran South Academy. Uh, so they come have items and materials there. Yep, come on up, come on up. Go on up, come on yep. up. Up here on the platform, up on the steps. It'd be great. I'm gonna sneak out this hey, way. this is for a private, parochial, a public. Can't think of another P. If you're a homeschool parent, you should be up here. All right? <laughs> These are educators. So come on, get froggy, jump in, let's go. <laughs> I see most, I haven't trying to call anybody out. No, I'm not going to call anybody out. Uh, we are, as Gloria Day, privileged and incredibly blessed uh, to have educators among us uh, in a partnership that we have with our community. And what we're asking for you today is to pray for these folks. Um, as Vicar Steve said, um, teaching is not always easy because not all the kids are as perfect as yours. Um, there, some of them aren't as perfect. And these folks are doing some amazing ministry in the trenches day in and day out, whether in a, a Christian school or a public school, uh, the opportunity. So this is our chance to, as a congregation, set them apart and to celebrate what God is gonna do in and through them in this school year. All right, educators. Um, whether you're in the classroom, whether you're uh, in an office and you're, man, why are you so divided? Y'all can come <laughs> up here, join in the middle. Come on, bring, come, get, be all together. Come on, we're a big group of people here. Yeah, it's, it's, it's okay. It's, it, I promise you, it is okay. Um, you have an amazing privilege of shaping the generation uh, to come. And um, you guys have the opportunity to uh, let your light shine. You see, whether you're in a Christian school where it's easier and expected to share your faith or in a public school where you gotta figure out how to, how to do it, you each have a calling. You each have a ministry. Um, and I don't want you to take that, uh, I want you to take that seriously, not take that lightly. Uh, because these kids that are emp empowered to your care for 180 days this year, uh, come from broken homes. They come from families who uh, those kids are not loved and shown respect and cared for. Uh, and they're coming to you for whatever reason, not only for education, but for their social and spiritual development. In, in Matthew chapter five, we're gonna talk about this next week. We talk about how uh, 
Jesus says, you are the light of the world. And you're to let your light shine to all those kids and all those parents that you interact with. Even when you get that email that you, oh, you got to be kidding me. Or you get that parent-teacher conference where their kid is a saint and you're the problem. You have the opportunity to share God's grace, his love, and build a partnership and support with the home. And so I thank you for your ministry. I thank you for all that you do, the long hours that you put in, the heart and the commitment you have to our children. You are making a difference. And I want you to know this place is praying for you. That we value what you're doing in the lives of these students. Pastor Randy, would you, would you pray for them? Lord, we come before you and we lift up these educators and we thank you for their calling, for the gifts and talents that are represented here. Lord, we pray over them that you would fill them with your spirit. And Lord, when the days or weeks or months are tough, Lord, that you would give them the strength to persevere. Lord, also give them the joy and the celebrations mm -hmm. when their students achieve great things because of what they've done. Yeah. Lord, thank you for their passion, their enthusiasm, and for what you're going to do through them as they touch the lives of so many students. So, Lord, we thank you and we pray all this in your son Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Hey, I'm invite the congregation to stand up. Uh, by the way, I didn't introduce myself. I'm Pastor Dan, one of the pastors here. Um, and uh, as we close the service, we have a, your first time here, you might see some folks put their hands out. That's a, that's a posture of receiving a blessing. It's not, a, it's not something you have to do to be part of the club. I, I, you know, it's okay. But what I do want you to do is I want you to put a hand out because we're gonna bless these teachers. They're gonna see you blessing them. You teachers, educators, all, all I want you to do is receive. This, this, this is you receive the blessing of the Lord through the members and the family, your family here at Gloria Day. So Lord, bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you, be gracious unto you. The Lord look upon you with his favor and grant you his peace now and forevermore. God bless you in a wonderful school year. We give thanks and praise for you guys. Thank you so very much. Have a blessed week, Gloria Day.